Well, welcome back to our study in the Epistles of John. And thanks for allowing us to take off a week. A week, yes. But we're back after a week off. Had a good camp. Enjoyed it very Did much. Did you have a good camp? A lot of Did great camps. Did you play kids. no golf? You're in your red. Well, you know. I feel I... like I'm with Tiger Woods today. Oh, there you go. It's the red. It's the uh, it's yeah. the finals. Yeah, final it's the Sunday, finals. Yeah. Yes. So, but not this is just a camp carryover. That's what it is. That's what so, it is. Okay. So the camp high continues, but but it's good to get back into it. So, are you ready? I guess I am. All right. Well, I'll have to confess. This is the first time I've ever taught a class on Second John. I have read from Second John every now and then in a sermon, uh, maybe grabbing a couple of verses that are later in this letter, but. This is the first time I've ever just really jumped into it. And if you're getting into it now after our study in 1 John, boy, there's some similarities here indeed. If there was any debate about who the author is, it should be settled by just simply the content. I think he is putting into effect what he's talked about in theory in 1 John. Now he's writing uh, to two different situations and basically saying to them they need to be practicing what he's been preaching. Yeah, and uh, if you're familiar with Second John and Third John, they carry kind of a unique message. Second John's written to a group, and we're going to get into who possibly the elect lady is here in a moment. But while Second John's written to a group, possibly churches or a large family, Third John's written more to an individual, to yes. Gaius. But they carry the same admonition all together that John has been sharing in 1 John. We're going to find once again, here's the social test, the doctrinal test, and the moral test. They're all three going to come out in this letter. Yes. And so it's it's really interesting. So you ready to jump into Let's it? Let's go. How do you want to start? Do you want me just to read all of it, or do you want to go in sections here? What do you Let's do the first three verses, and then we'll go from there. Okay, first three verses, Second John. The elder to the elect lady and her children, whom I love in truth, and not only I, but also all who know the truth, because of the truth that abides in us and will be with us forever. Grace, mercy, and peace will be with us from God the Father and from Jesus Christ the Father's Son in truth and love. All right, Mark, I'll leave it with you. Who's the elect lady? Right off the bat, this is your chance to solve it. The century-old debate. Just did. It just did? I'm going, no, I said, that's just it. I would even start with the elder, and then we'll get to the chosen right lady. <laughs> well, I've got an opinion on that one. Well, I'll give you my opinion, and then we'll talk about the chosen lady. Uh, I don't think he's an elder in the church. It's not like a fellow elder that Peter was talking about. Um but I think this is a name that may be an honor, something, an accolade that they have given to him over time. He's the last of the apostles, and uh, I see them calling him the elder apostle and uh, just honoring him, and now they call him the elder, just in short. And so he had taken that on. So I think that's what the elder means there. So uh, in this relationship here, you're the elder. I'm not the last. I'm not the last elder. <laughs> well, well, I just kind of see a correlation here. Yeah, yeah the true. elder. But you know, I I will say I think that's also more or less what is being referred to. John, if we're looking at a date here, uh, probably very similar to what we talked about with First John. Yes. We're looking very late in the first century and. Uh, I even read some commentators and historians that might have even assumed that this is John writing even around the time that he wrote the Revelation. So whether he's in Ephesus or maybe even be exiled on Patmos, uh, he is certainly older and and he would refer to him as I'm the elder. Well, and, and the thing that we need to um, to remind ourselves of, there are people through history then that wanted to take this uh, saying it's a John, but an elder John, and there's those who don't want to attribute that to the apostle John, right. that in fact maybe he was an elder in one of the churches, uh, and so they want to take away the importance of maybe second and third John uh, versus John writing the gospel and first John. I don't believe that, but you'll some people may read that when they're reading right. um, 
uh, to study Second and Third John. I, I think this is just a name that had been given to to John. And, and, and it would be he's a, accepting it in a term of, of yeah, affection. Yeah, it's, it's a, yeah. an endearment. Term. And, and there's certainly similarities, and and we mentioned this just a moment ago in the writing that really fits very well in First John. Uh, the elect lady, uh, individual here, or are we talking about church? You know, I've vacillated on that for years, um, and I've gone from one to the other, but I am now choosing the side that this is this is a, uh, a metaphor for the church, um, and I do that for some reasons. One, if this is an if this is a lady, he didn't name her. She's supposed to be so famous that all the churches know her. Mm -hmm. Well, also, she then has an elect sister. So they basically have the same name, the same alkaline. And so the second point is, if you're looking at the Greek here, in fact, then the children, based upon um, the syntax there and, and the neuter, that is males mm -hmm. if this is talking about a lady and so it's only males that this chosen lady has had and also the lady down in in verse 13 has only had male children as well so that that's just a language thing but he he names the person in third John. right so i would think that if he was going to this was going to be a special lady or a specific lady he would have named us what he did in gaius when we talk about third. So I, I'm inclined to think that this is, I'm guessing, a, I think it's an individual church, not church in general. I really believe that second and third John may be written somewhat together because he's saying the very same things at the end of the chapter uh, in second John and third John. There's some things I want to say to you, but I, it's too much to say. I need to come to you and see you. Um, so I, I really think, in my mind, and this is just my opinion, I think Second John was written to the church, uh, and then Third John was written to a particular leader in that church that he wanted to identify, and I think it's going to the same place. That's, that's what I feel. Well, and i I, I got to confess, that's where I lean on this as well. Uh, you certainly see the, the metaphor in play here, yeah. and, and maybe to some degree he's kind of bringing into some of what he did with Revelation. You have these pictures and, and the idea of a word picture uh, with the lady. One thing is for certain, uh, whether it's a church or an individual, they're bearing fruit yes. and there's offspring and there are those that are growing. So it would be a group or an individual that is highly productive in the Lord's kingdom. And John is very fond of them and yes. very fond. I, I'll just say my opinion, he's fond of this church and what yes. they're doing. And, and he's concerned about them, and hence, uh, hence the letter. But, but even the letter, he's not revealing everything that he wants to say. No. I, I want to come and speak to you, like and you said. I want to... I want face to do to that. Face. There, there's some issues at this particular congregation, seemingly. He's praising most of them, but there must be some issues there that he wants to identify and talk about in person. And when we get to 3 John, uh, I wouldn't he's got an individual want one. to be diatrophies yeah. that he's going to be yeah. upset. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, John, John yeah. makes no bones about it. No. If he's upset with somebody yeah. or not fond of well, somebody, uh, he, he'll make it very clear. Well, it's yeah. like Paul in, yeah. in Corinth. He says, you don't want me to come as an apostle. You want me to come as your friend. friend yes. Well, I'm saying the same thing here with John. You, he, diatrophies probably wouldn't want him to come as an apostle. Yeah. And it looks to me like he was coming as an apostle. Now, the first few verses, very gracious, yes. uh, wonderful uh, opening. But now he shares his concern. Uh, and I couldn't help, just from an elder point of view, thinking of Brother Ehrman. This yes. is Ehrman in one of his common phrases, Brethren, I'm concerned. Yes. And so here is the concern. Verse 4. I rejoice greatly to find some of your children walking in the truth, just as we were commanded by the Father. And now I ask, dear lady, not as though I were writing to you a new commandment, but the one that we have had from the beginning, that we love one another. And this is love, that we walk according to his commandments. This is the commandment, 
just as you have heard from the beginning, so that you should walk in it. For many deceivers have gone out into the world, those who do not confess the com coming of Jesus Christ in the flesh. Such a one is a deceiver and the antichrist. Watch yourselves so that you may not lose what we have worked for, but may win a full reward. Everyone who goes on ahead and does not abide in the teaching of Christ does not have God. Whoever abides in the teaching has both the Father and the Son. If anyone comes to you and does not bring this teaching, do not receive him into your house or give him any greeting. For whoever greets him takes part in his wicked ways. All right, like we said, we went from gracious to like our old dear brother Ehrman, uh, our elder here for many years says, I am concerned. And the concern is... We have those who are influencing our brethren yes. regarding the deity of Jesus that he didn't come in the flesh. We're back to Gnosticism. Well, we're back to the Gnosticism and the teaching of the Gnostics are this idea of loving one another. And so this is paramount in his mind. Uh, you've got to follow the command right. uh, that we love one another. I was suspicioning that your verses that you probably have taught from in Second John are probably going to be verses eight and nine. Oh, absolutely! Which, which are yeah. the famous verses yeah. uh, in in Second John. But the key is you've got to know what's going on in four through seven before we get ourselves sure. to what he's talking about there. But yes, it's number one, you have commands to follow, and number two, you're supposed to be loving one another. And as I said before, I think he's now putting into practice what he taught in First John. Well, I love the analogy here, and, and, and you see this in other places, especially in the New Testament, the idea of walking, yes. walking. This is, this is a pattern. This is a lifestyle. You are walking in the truth. So what would be walking in the truth, according to John? Well, it takes us back to what we studied in 1 John. There is the social test, loving your brethren. There is the moral test, keeping the Lord's commandments. And then there is the doctrinal test believing in the deity of Jesus that he came in the flesh and and all three of those things are here once again discussed by John and his concern now is that he's away from them and clearly there are deceivers coming and he calls them antichrist because they do not believe in the full deity of Jesus and I think they're already there I think okay. that's his concern uh, and they're there and he's very concerned about how they're influencing uh, these brethren. Happily, he can say in verse 4, uh, I, I understand that some of you, some of your children are walking in the truth. So at this particular congregation, not everyone is caved to the Gnostics. There are, and I'm hoping a good number, that are continuing to walk. And to make your point about the walk, it's an ongoing process. It is yeah. an everyday ongoing process. And we're going to get down here into verses 8 and 9. He talks about losing. If, if we're not walking as we're supposed to be walking, we in fact can lose that. And for the life of me, I don't understand people who take the position of once saved, always saved. Why would then would we have these ad admonitions we're going to be talking about? Continue to walk in the truth. Continue uh, to understanding the commandments. Continue doing these things. Um, so he's talking to people here. He's very concerned about them maintaining their salvation. Well, I mean, and you look at it. Let's go ahead and jump to it. This is verses 8 and 9. Uh, and, and this is the warning. Uh, if... If verse uh, verse 1 is, I love you. Verse 5 is, I'm asking you. Verse 8 is, I'm warning yes. you. Watch uh, yourselves. And so watch yourselves. And, and, and he talks about the fear uh, that should come with those who abandon the doctrine of Christ. Yes. You, you're walking away from God. And so I think some people stumble over the idea of a full reward. That phrase, he says, full yeah. reward. So, oh, well, you can just have a partial yeah. reward. So you can partially get him, but not, no. You're over here in the corner. Yeah, over that's, here with the partials. That's, that's not no. what he's saying, because to me, he justifies exactly what he means by that. Anybody who goes ahead, goes beyond what is written, goes beyond what is taught in verse 9, and doesn't abide fully in the doctrine of Christ, that would be everything that Christ teaches, then that person does not 
have God. I mean, that's exactly you don't have saying God. that there. That is so clear. Yeah. And, and it's interesting here. He's going on and saying that who goes too far? Yeah. You, you got people that that add to, and there's people that take away from. Uh, he's talking to the people who've been, in their mind, adding to. We have a little extra here. You have the Word of God, but we have something to add to that. In our minds, as human beings, this would be good for us to do. And we're told in Scripture, we're prepared, or supposed to be prepared, to every good work. Mm -hmm. Well, where are we finding those works? It should be in the Scripture. He's saying here, be careful about going too far. Be careful about you adding something to what the Word of God says. And he's, he's saying, if you do that, you've left the faith. Well, and it's kind of like uh, in the Old Testament. Uh, we often look back at the idolatry of Israel, uh, whether it was at Mount Sinai with the golden calf or even the bells and the asterisks uh, in the land of Canaan. We, we kind of all even get the impression, well, they just abandoned Jehovah altogether. No, no they tried to add to yeah. Jehovah. The golden calf was, this is what our Jehovah looks like. That's we right. believe in God. Yeah. This is what he looks like. Well, the same thing with the Gnostics here. You would go up and speak to somebody and say, do you believe in Jesus? Oh, Absolutely. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. But John's point is, no, they don't believe in the fullness That's right. of Jesus. They're adding to what scripture has shared and, and granted they didn't see Jesus like he had another thing that we talked about yeah. in first John and so they're doing what many Greeks would do and encourage them to do in their pagan religion and that is to say flesh is evil all the time there's no way Jesus came in the flesh he was simply an illusion uh, and and even the idea of him dying on the cross impossible for deity in that form and so they believed in Jesus, but not in the total fullness of the way Jesus is referred to and represented in Scripture. You have that with Paul in all of his Gospels. Think about it. You, they were constantly fighting what? Judaizing teachers. You had those Jews who had apparently become Christians, mm -hmm. but they wanted to add some of the old law in addition uh, to what was being taught they wanted to add circumcision. They may have wanted to add uh, sacrifices and things of that nature so we could be comfortable with this, uh, assimilating into this the old law as well. And he's saying, no, no. you have what I've given you. Don't be adding to that. And that's what he, Paul was trying to say to the, uh, to the Judaizers back in his Gospels. Yeah, and the Antichrist, uh, and we see that term here again, first of all, I think we can certainly make the point there the Antichrist is here, the idea that Antichrist yes. is coming. Once again, Paul puts it in the present. And and it's not just one, it's many Antichrist. Yes. But at the same time, it's not somebody who just denies Jesus altogether that he didn't exist. They're denying his deity. And as you listen to what John is saying, they're denying the full doctrine of Christ. Yes. Uh, if you gave this a modern day application, it would be somebody who says, you know, I'm just going to go by the red letters in the Gospels and mm -hmm. everything in the epistles that talks about morality or talks about church or anything else. That's not as important to me. I'm just going to keep this. Yeah. Well, John would say, no, no, you're denying Christ that's in right. that respect. Uh, it's either all or none. And and that's his fear is false teaching in that form. That that term there does not have God. That's that should strike fear into all of our hearts. Mm -hmm. If we're wanting to add to or take away from Scripture, the Lord's not going to put up with that. He says you do not have Him. He has given you rules to live by. He's given you commandments. He's expecting certain things out of you, and God can do that. And if you do not do those things, guess what? You do not have have God that should strike yeah. <laughs> some that's the fear the punishment yeah, fear we right. should be having well and you'll notice too in verse 7 here's the cause for all this warning is they they would not confess that Jesus had come in the flesh yes uh, while that may be hard for us to grasp deity in the flesh the point is 
it's the way God has presented himself to us. And if he didn't come in the flesh, then how can he be the sympathizer with us as the great high priest who's been tempted in all ways like we are? That's right. How can he be the suffering servant of one who would be the lamb that would be taken to the slaughter? How can he be even the resurrected one who came back and and the apostles were saying, oh, here, look at my, look, you can look and see the imprints of the nails. And, you know, there was bodily form there. And. This is only about 60 years after yeah, Christ was yeah. on this earth. Mm -hmm. And so quickly, those people who had never seen him are taking the position. The Gnostics had it pretty difficult, i.e. some of them wanted to say he never existed. He was just a figment of your imagination. Then there was others saying, well, there may have been a fleshly Jesus, but he wasn't the Son of God. So you had both of those sides to the Gnostics uh, teaching different things, and he's pointing out here those who said he never came in the flesh um this bunch they're deceivers right he was here i'm a witness i may be the last witness and but you better believe me because i've seen him i've touched him i've heard him i've eaten with him i've done all of those things he's here can i go or back was. to the walking with truth yes. thing there uh to me this is a great uh point for, that john is making because he just takes okay what does it mean to be in the truth? What does it mean to be walking in truth? Well, does it matter what you believe? Well, John would say absolutely. What do you believe yes. about Jesus? Do you believe his deity? What you believe is paramount in walking in truth. But John said that's not it. It's also how do you live? Uh, are you keeping the commandments? Are you morally following the will of God? So he would say, yep, that's a part of it too. So how are you living? What is your relationship to the commandments of God? Are you seeking to walk in them? And again, you find walk again in verse 6, walking according to the commandments. So he would say, it's what you believe, it's how you live. But then there's one more element. It's how you work with others and how you live with others. Are you loving the brethren? Are you loving others? So you have what is internal, what is vertical in our relationship to God, and then what is horizontal in our relationship to one another. All three of those are involved and made up of what it means to walk in the truth. He uses the term light mm -hmm. in First John, right. walking in the light. Right. But the terms are the same, walking. Mm -hmm. it, is, it is a continual process. It's not a one process. I've done this now. I'm in God. Mm -hmm. uh, I am now a saved individual. I, I can pretty much do what I want to do. The Gnostics were saying that. Sure. But John is saying, no, this is a continual process. You are continuing in the commands. You are continuing to love one another. You are continuing in that relationship with Christ and with God. You're having to do all of those things. All right, let's get to the other challenging verse here. We kind of had some fun with the elect and the elder there. And it's good to know that you're the elder. Uh, <laughs> but here's the other challenging one. Verse 10. John says, this is John the Apostle. If someone comes to you and is not bringing this teaching, the totality of this teaching, walking in the truth, don't receive him into your house. Don't give him any greeting. And here's another warning. For whoever greets him takes part in his wicked works. Kick them out. Don't deal with them. Run from them. He said in 1 John they had taken themselves out. Mm -hmm. We see in other scriptures if you have people continuing to sow discord, the elders are supposed to deal with them. So we do understand that process. It's John as an apostle the indwelling of the Holy Spirit sees that if you accept wrong and continue to live with wrong and pat them on the back and say, go in peace, that can only become a disaster. You know, he almost refers to it as aiding and abetting That's to right. some degree here. And if so, you're not drawing a line and you're greeting them, and I think the idea of greeting them it wouldn't be just, hey, how are you? No, it would be the idea of a fellowship yeah. greeting yes. together. And, and, and so I, I think he's saying here, recognize sin and be careful of it. Don't be part of it. And 
Paul says the same things in, in Romans 1. What does he say about people? He gives you that big, long list of things that's just upsetting to the Lord. And he says, and oh, by the way, some of you, you may not be participating but in that. But you approve of these but, things. But you don't say anything yeah. about it. So what happens? Mm -hmm. You are really showing your approval, mm -hmm. seemingly. And so John, I think, is giving that warning. Don't, we can't glad hand continually people who are showing that they believe in wrong, they accept wrong, and you may not be able to change them. We have to be careful about that because if you bring that in to your assembly and if you continue to, uh, to listen to them, it may not go well with you. Yeah, well, and it's not like there isn't grace and mercy involved, yeah, exactly. but there's got to be a limit. You, again, if you go to Third John, he calls out an individual. Yeah. Just in case you're wondering who one of these people might be. Yeah. I got a name, name for you. I got a name for you. Diotrephes. I'll just tell you right now. Right. It's Diotrephes. If you're wondering who you shouldn't be greeting in your house. That's right. Uh, it's probably a fellow by the name of Diotrephes. That's so, right. So, ultimately, though, you find John once again reaching out because of his love for the brethren, his beloved. And he speaks as the one, the elder, the father figure Beware. Yes. Beware. Yeah. Uh, but I have a lot more to say to you. I'd love to say more. You want to close it out here? Verses 12 and 13. Though I have much to write to you, I would rather not use paper and ink. Instead, I hope to come to you and to talk face to face so that our joy may be complete. The children of your elect sister greet you. Uh, I'd, I'd kind of like you to say something here and then I'll throw it out to you. Face to face communication is always the best. Yes. Uh, anytime there's turmoil, anytime there's a challenge, anytime there's controversy, uh, anytime there is a, any kind of hint of miscommunication, face to face is always going to be the best. Uh, there's lots of ways for us to communicate even today, but it doesn't beat face to face communication. If there's problems, it, that's the best way to solve them. If there's commendations, yes, you might be able to send letters and say, you're doing good, guys. Uh, just keep it up. Um, but he's saying here, I have got some, I've got some concerns, and I'm not going to put it in print because you may mis, mistake it. Uh, you may not quite understand it. I want to be there with you, and so I can say these things to you face so, to face. So I love you is what he says in verse one. I ask you, uh, verse five. I warn you, verse eight. And then verse 12, I hope to come to you. Yes, I hope to be. That's why I think this, these were probably written after 1 John. Mm -hmm. uh, in this case, I think uh, our canon people got it right. Mm -hmm. uh, second and 3 John probably followed 1 John. I'm not so sure they got it right in Peter, but we'll talk about oh, that. Well, we, start we, to talk we may about start talking about Peter. That's right. We'll talk about that if we study Peter. But um, here I think they got it right. He's, he's written a letter probably to these congregations already. He's saying now there are some specific things I really want to get across to you. I need to see you. So if you were to lump all this together with a theme, I've got loving others within the limit that truth allows. Exactly. What would you put? That's exactly what he's saying here. You are to love one another. And I think we are to love the soul of the person who is in sin. The I, deceiver. I, yeah, the even sin. the deceiver. I think yeah. you're supposed to love that if you could say something to him in time to maybe change his mind. But I think he said over here in First John, I think some of these boys are already so far gone that there's just no way you're going to get them back. Uh, and in those circumstances, do not participate with them. And isn't it interesting, too, that here's an apostle, an apostle who is pleading with brethren to listen to him. Yes. Boy, the deception of Satan is great, isn't it? And you're certainly going to see it in Third John, uh, that they would be more willing and easily deceived yeah. to listen to an apostle. Uh, you know, uh, some man instead I mean, of an apostle. You, yeah. It's John, and it's old John, the beloved, the elder. Yeah. Well, it, I, I am probably going to take the position that if the Lord came back today to come to worship service you wonder just how many people would be there to receive him and how quickly 
they might just sort of disappear oh, yeah. after a period of time. <laughs> because gospels, you have it. It happened all the time. Sunday. It happened all the time yes. in, the, in the Gospels, yes. you know. And, and so even the Lord himself. He, laid, he raised Lazarus from the dead. Yes. What did they decide? Yeah, well, they we got to kill, kill him. him. We got to kill him. Right. You know, speaking of elders, we got one peeking in on us over here. <laughs> Gerald, how are we doing? We okay so far? Okay so far. Okay so far. <laughs> we just got a thumbs up. <laughs> So you've been trumped elder oh, Okay, that yeah, respect. that's right. Okay, so good. Well, I think we got it all. 13 verses. Uh, and the children of your elect sister. That's why I, I lean more toward the church. That's right. You're getting more of those. Maybe this was an influential church, and here's the offspring that have come from all those that are growing. You know, from. in my mind, I think the sister church is Ephesus. And he is probably there at Ephesus, and he's writing maybe to one of the churches, maybe more, uh, throughout Asia there. Uh, and so go over to Revelation, see which ones were in bad shape, yeah. see which ones were in good shape. Yeah, that's right. And maybe you can start making, well, maybe they, Gaius was a part of one of these congregations or diatrophies. Yeah, possibly so. Possibly so. Well, you got anything else? No, Elder? We're good. All right. Well, next week, we'll go to Third John. So we'll study 3rd John next week, and that will wrap up our study uh, in the epistles of John. But we've been talking, and we're leaning toward going to 1st Peter uh, after our study uh, of the epistles of John. So uh, again, these studies are going to continue. Now before we say goodbye, I want to just give everybody a reminder of what's coming up July the 11th. Yes. Uh, July the 11th, we will return as a family in Christ to one assembly. No more two assemblies, one assembly. And we will begin at 9 o'clock with Bible class, and then a worship assembly will follow. Uh, and we still want to encourage everybody, if you want to bring your own individual communion, we will still provide uh, the communion cups and the individual containers out front. But we're going to continue with individual communion, and then the contribution box will still be in the yes. foyer. That will continue. But we will have a longer class period starting at 9 o'clock on that July the 11th. And so that'll run about 35 minutes, and then the assemblies will follow. People sometimes shy away from this term class. Mm -hmm. So why don't we just start calling it a, we're going to have a Bible study. There you go. Well, assembly. Yes. The assembly yes. begins at 9. That's we right. gather at 9. We're going to assemble at 9 to study the Bible. There you go. Just like what we're doing here. Yes. All right. Well, as always, if you have any questions or comments, please reach out to us. We would love to hear from you, and we would like to make this as interactive as we possibly can. But as, as we've said more than once, we really appreciate everybody's participation, and thanks so much for all your encouragement to us as we continue this study. Got anything else? That's it. All right. Well, thank you so much, brethren. God bless you. Good night, brethren.